Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the University of Bristol and to this second Coleridge Lecture in partnership with the Bristol Green European Capital 2015 and the Cabot Institute. My name is Joanna Birch Brown. It's a great pleasure for me to get to introduce our speaker this evening. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Bristol and I work on areas related to environmental ethics and social justice, so it's um, immensely pleasurable for me to have this chance to think in the sort of practical realm about some of the same kinds of issues. Um, Anna Coote is the head of social policy at the uh, New Economics Foundation, which is the UK's sort of leading think tank for economic, environmental, and social justice. Um, she's the editor of Time on Our Side, which is um, sort of a, a collection which explores the benefits of a shorter working week. Other recent publications for the NEF include um, The Wisdom of Prevention, which focuses on the importance of preventing harms before they happen, as opposed to simply having a responsive strategy. Also, Cutting It, which is focuses on the sort of a critical exploration of the big society and uh, its relationship to austerity measures. Um, and 21 Hours, which is also focused on the benefits of a shorter working week. Um, Anna Kud is a leading analyst, writer, and advocate in the field of social policy. And uh, she has been responsible for groundbreaking work in health and sustainable development. Um, as part of the, as the Commissioner for Health with the UK Sustainable Development Commission from 2000 to 2009. She led the Healthcare Commission, uh, Healthcare Commission's work on engaging patients and the public from 1998 to 2004. Uh, from 1989 to 1998, she was the uh, director of health policy at the King's Fund. And earlier posts include a uh, senior research fellow and deputy director of the IPPR, Institute for Public Policy Research. Um, before that, she, <laughs> sorry, this is so long, but I, I can't help it. She's had such a distinguished career. Um, she was the editor and producer of Current Affairs Television for Diverse Productions. And she was the deputy editor of The New Statesman from 1978 to 1982. So we have an immensely accomplished um, and very impressive uh, speaker this evening. Um, so I think Anna's gonna speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes to take questions. Um, and yeah, at the end of the talk, I'll come up and share questions. So join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you for inviting me here to this wonderful event. I want to talk about the work that we've been doing at the New Economics Foundation over the last few years to envisage a new social settlement, which led to a report that was published last week, so it's all hot off the press, new stuff. So a social settlement is an agreement between citizens about how we all interact with each other, between ourselves and through government and state institutions. And the last settlement in the UK was in the 1940s, about 70 years ago. Um, this was a response to the uh, financial crash of the 1930s and, of course, the devastations of the Second World War. Um, it produced the Beveridge Report and the uh, Welfare State, that has shaped our politics and our, and our daily experience ever since. It aimed to create full employment in a flourishing market economy and to deal collectively with the risks that individuals can't cope with on their own. So there was a degree of management of the macroeconomy by government. There was free education, the National Health Service, benefits, pensions for those out of work, decent housing for all, and much more. Now, in many respects, the post-war settlement has been a huge success, but it hasn't kept pace with changing needs and expectations. It's criticized for being too big, top-down, and inflexible. And the political consensus that supported the post-war settlement has begun to disintegrate, and now the very existence of a welfare state is contested territory. Meanwhile, social and economic inequalities are widening dramatically. One in four children living in poverty and uh, 
rising levels of conspicuous consumption, and now an obscene and widening gap between the super-rich and the 99%, as this graph shows. We have uh, climate change and rapid depletion of the Earth's natural resources, which threaten the very future of society within an alarmingly short span of years. And of course, it isn't just weather extremes um, in the UK that we have to worry about. This is a flood in the Thames Valley last year. But it's how the daily habits that we take for granted are burdening the planet in an increasingly intolerable way. And then there are the prospects for political change, which have congealed as wealthy elites capture and accumulate power through privileged access to networks and institutions and to mach de decision-making machinery in markets and in government. Here's George Osborne with the Masters of the Universe at the London Stock Exchange. So we have these new challenges, widening inequalities, uh, catastrophic uh, degradation of the natural resources and um, accumulation of power by wealthy elites. And we need a new settlement to meet these challenges, to uh, reduce social and economic inequalities, to help to avert catastrophe in the environment and to distribute power more equally. This is our report, and our aim is to safeguard and strengthen the best elements of the post-war settlement, but to set new priorities and a new direction of travel. I should say right now, this is not pretending to be a new beverage plan, for those of you who know what I mean by a new beverage plan. It's the New Economics Foundation's contribution to current thinking about the welfare state and the kind of society we all want for the future. And it highlights issues that tend to be left in the margins of political debate. And it is specifically about the UK, but set in a global context. So it's mainly about domestic politics and policy. It isn't a list of technical solutions to immediate problems. It's not something you can hand to the political parties for this year's election manifestos. It's more ambitious than that. It's about changing systems and structures over the longer term. We do offer specific practical proposals, but what we really want to do is to change the ideological weather. In, the in today's climate, we're supposed to believe that free markets and small government are the answers to our problem, that neoliberal economics is an irrefutable science, that the only thing that really matters is more economic growth, and that social and economic inequalities are simply collateral damage. The New Economics Foundation has been working hard for more than a quarter of a century to challenge this dominant narrative and to show that other things are possible. And our proposals for a new social settlement are part of that effort to build a new economics that serves the interests of people and the planet, not the other way around. This is about who we are, how we live together, what we value, what we're trying to achieve for ourselves, for each other, and for coming generations, and which way we turn to start moving in the right direction. The settlement's got three goals, social justice, environmental sustainability, and a more equal distribution of power. By social justice, we mean that everyone should be able to fulfill their potential and participate in society, regardless of background or circumstance. It's about creating the conditions for everyone to have their needs met and to be able to flourish. And that's no small thing at a time when economic inequalities are rising almost exponentially. By environmental sustainability, we mean living within planetary boundaries and safeguarding natural resources for future as well as present generations. I'm not sure how much I need to labor the point in this audience about the huge gravity of climate change and its implications for human well-being. The scientific consensus gets stronger by the day. The prognosis gets more challenging by the day. And that's why we insist that a new social settlement must have environmental sustainability at its heart. 
Without it, there would be no society to have a settlement for. Social justice and environmental sustainability depend on each other for fulfillment. The problems they're addressing, widening inequalities and wreckage of the planet, are rooted together in the way that capitalist markets treat human and natural resources, simply as inputs to production and means of consumption. Both goals depend on collective action through government as well as through civil society. They're about aver averting risks that individuals cannot cope with on their own. So there's a lot of connection between those two goals. And our third goal, about a more equal distribution of power, recognizes the grave dangers of power being captured by elites and used to shore up their own advantage, often resisting changes that threaten their interests, including moves to narrow inequalities or cut carbon emissions. This goal also recognizes the transformative potential of people who are not rich and powerful having more control over decisions and actions that affect their lives. And without a more equal distribution of power, it would be impossible to pursue the goals of social justice and environmental sustainability. <coughs> so those are our goals. We then set out a fourfold strategy for pursuing them. Now, what I'm about to say is not everything that needs to happen, not by any means, but it's what makes this settlement, this, these proposals for a settlement, distinctive. These are four issues that we think are crucial but seldom feature prominently or at all in current policy debates. So the first one is we need to plan for prosperity without growth. This marks a radical shift away from the logic of the post-war settlement, which was based on the assumption that the economy would continue to grow, uh, yielding more and more tax revenues to have bigger and better public services. Not only is growth an unreliable prospect since the crash of 2008, not only are the growth forecasts across the rich world much lower than they were before the crash, but once you bring environmental sustainability into the picture, it becomes clear that continuing economic growth, especially in the rich world, is not an option. Tim Jackson, the environmental economist, among others, has argued this point persuasively. He says the idea that we can somehow achieve weightless growth with zero emissions to stabilize the climate or protect against resource scarcity is nothing short of delusional. And even if it were possible to raise more funds, for example, by closing tax loopholes or abandoning vanity projects like Trident, we couldn't spend it all on the welfare state because we also need to invest urgently and heavily in pro-environmental measures like renewable energy and sustainable housing and transport systems. So a new social settlement must be designed to function well with little or no additional resources from the public purse. We have to do more and better for less. This leads to our second objective, which is to shift investment and action upstream to prevent harm. And by harm, we mean things like unemployment, mental or physical ill health, homelessness, social disorder, violent crime, and so on. We must get better at preventing these problems instead of just coping with them when they happen and having, trying to deal with the consequences. So we say that a new social settlement must focus on upstream early action. That's a first-class education for everyone, keeping people well instead of just treating them when they're sick, making it possible for everyone to earn a decent living, building strong social networks within communities and across neighborhoods. All this makes for a better quality of life, and it can save a lot of money in the longer run. It won't be easy. There are plenty of barriers that we outline in the report, but we must have prevention as a priority. Our third objective is to nurture what we call the core economy. And this, we think, will help us to flourish without growth and to make the shift towards early action. By the core economy, we mean all the unpaid, undervalued, and overlooked assets 
that people have in their everyday lives and relationships. These are uncommodified things. Time, wisdom, experience, energy, knowledge, skills, love, empathy, responsibility, care, reciprocity, teaching, and learning. These human and social resources are produced and exchanged outside the formal economy, yet they're central to our lives and they're essential to society. Without them, the formal economy would grind to a halt. So while we can't grow the formal economy, this core economy can flourish and expand, or it can weaken and decline, and that depends on how it's valued, understood, and treated. We argue that it must be brought into the center of policymaking so that it can be supported and so that it can flourish. We want to shift the foundations of the settlement from an economy based on material resources, which are scarce, to one based on human resources, which are, after all, abundant. And we want to shift from a deficit model of problems that need fixing by others to building on assets and strengths that already exist. But we're not starry-eyed about the core economy. Yes, it does shape and sustain everyday life, but it also reflects and reproduces inequalities in everyday life, not least inequalities between women and men. Just think, women are doing the vast majority of unpaid labor in the home. So if we're going to nurture the core economy, we have to do it in ways that narrow inequalities. And there's an important role for government and for state institutions to create the conditions for more equal participation in the core economy, as well as a vibrant civil society and confident, creative local action. This brings us to the last of our four objectives, which is to foster solidarity. Not a very fashionable word these days, but uh, we think it's very important. By solidarity, we mean encouraging feelings of sympathy and responsibility between people. It's about sharing risks, pooling resources, and acting together in pursuit of common interests through state institutions, local and national, but also through civil society. Solidarity picks out the need for people to value each other as equals and to understand what we have in common both in the core economy and in the formal economy, both within close-knit groups and also between strangers and groups of different kinds. And for environmental sustainability, we need solidarity between present and future generations so that we meet our own needs today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that's the vision, the direction of travel, foster solidarity, nurture the core economy, prevent harm, and plan for prosperity without growth. Four objectives that will help to achieve our goals of sustainable, sorry, of social justice, environmental sustainability, and a more equal distribution of power. What follows next is a set of proposals for practical change, and these fall into three groups. They're about rebalancing work and time, releasing human assets, strengthening social security, and planning for the future. Now, what I've got time for now is just to summarize them briefly, but I want to focus on a few particular features. So the first group of proposals is about rebalancing work and time. And here we call for secure, satisfying, and sustainable work for all moving towards shorter and more flexible hours of paid work, improving hourly rates of pay, and providing high-quality childcare for all who need it. Together, these are about creating the conditions for everyone to earn a decent living, with stronger bargaining rights for employees, a higher wage floor, better opportunities to train and progress to more rewarding work, and a better balance between paid and unpaid time. So let me highlight the second proposal here, because full employment is only possible without economic growth if paid work is distributed more evenly across the population by moving to a shorter working week. 
We suggest 30 hours as the new standard, possibly moving towards 21. And in this and other work, um, the, the book that we've got here, um, Time on Our Side, we've done a lot of work in this area, and we show how shorter paid working hours alongside better hourly rates of pay can bring a range of social, environmental, and economic benefits. For society, as long as shorter hours are combined with a real offensive against low pay, it can help to improve health and well-being, to reduce stress and anxiety, making it easier to combine paid work and other responsibilities. It can help us all to be better parents and carers and friends and neighbours and citizens. It can make time for us to be politically engaged. One reason why I think we have a moribund democracy is that we haven't got time. That takes time to be politically engaged. And because this proposal is for men just as much as it, is, as it is for women, it can help to unlock those very intractable gender inequalities that uh, emerge from the way that labour is divided between paid and unpaid work and between women and men. It can also make childcare more affordable and it can make a much easier transition towards uh, retirement for people in later years, uh, a much smoother and more gradual transition. For the environment, shorter hours can help us get out of the fast lane and off the consumer treadmill, where we live to work and work to earn and earn to buy stuff that's produced in ways that are wrecking the planet. It gives us more time to live sustainably, to make and repair things, to grow things instead of buying things and so on. And countries with average, shorter average working hours tend to have smaller carbon footprint. Economists like Tim Jackson and Peter Victor, who are working out how we can manage a no-growth sustainable economy, find that moving towards shorter working hours does help to cut the risks of higher unemployment. And in addition, people who work shorter hours tend to be more productive hour for hour and make for a more loyal and committed workforce, both of which are good for business and good for the economy. And look at this graph. Here are 10 countries ranked by average working hours per capita. Now, if working shorter hours were bad for the economy, you might expect growth uh, GDP per capita to follow that red line there. But look, there's no correlation between hours of work and the strength of a country's economy. If anything, the trend is the other way around. So, I move on now to our next group of proposals, which is about releasing human resources. This is to nurture and grow the core economy. I've already said that a new social settlement must build on the assets that already exist in people's everyday lives and relationships. The aim here is to enable and encourage people to act together and take more control over their lives, both individually and collectively. The way things are now, people are discouraged and disabled. We want to shift that around. We propose making co-production the standard way of getting things done. Co-production is where people form equal partnerships um, between uh, people who use services and people who provide them, pooling different kinds of knowledge and skill, and they work together to identify their needs, to design services and other, or other activities to meet those needs, and where possible, they work together to do, deliver those services and activities. And we recommend changing the way that services are commissioned so that they focus on outcomes, not outputs, and embed the principles of co-production so that it becomes regular practice. There's enormous value, social and economic, in people being able to connect with each other and act together to discover, respect, and make use of their individual and shared resources, their time and energy, wisdom and experience, and their capacity to love and care for each other. Now, this can happen through things like uh, uh, local community activities like gardening or participatory budgeting uh, or time banking, um, and also through people getting together to identify what they need, making demands, and campaigning for change. What governments can do, especially at local level, is to help these unpaid assets and activities to flourish. But let me make this clear. 
Supporting the core economy and releasing human resources is not about rolling back the state and cutting public services and shunting responsibilities to families and communities, which is very much the agenda of the big society. It is about redesigning government functions so that public servants work with people, not just doing things to them, sharing power with them, giving them space, enabling people to take more control. So what would this involve? Well, for instance, creating spaces and hubs for people to meet, backup support for local groups and activities, training and equipment, more participative decision-making at every level, and more long-term security for local community-based groups who currently tend to limp along from one short-term grant to another and making sure that everyone has a chance to do this, especially those who are currently disadvantaged and disempowered. And it's worth remembering that although we greatly value what goes on in civil society, it is only government. It's the only vehicle that can act to promote equality across the population. And it's also worth remembering that all this activity takes time. So that underpins the importance of our proposal for a shorter working week. Our third group of proposals is about strengthening social security. And here we deal with services as well as benefits because we see them as the two sides of the same co coin. Both are needed for social security. Both need to change because the way they work at present, they're more often a cause of insecurity. The rules that govern them are increasingly about competition and choice and individuals fending for themselves and favoring hardworking people and treating everybody else as skivers and scroungers. Of course, in this discourse, hardworking only means people who are working for money. So we need to change that. Public services, and here I mean health and social care, education, and things like parks and leisure centers and street lighting and refuge, refuge collection as well, all these things play a crucial role in promoting social justice. They provide a virtual income that's worth on average the equivalent of three quarters of the post-tax income of the poorest groups in society, compared with just 14% for high income groups. But markets aren't helping to improve these services. In many parts of the welfare state, most notably the NHS, the introduction of market rules and profit-seeking companies is evidently doing more harm than good, driving up costs, um, leading a sort of a race to the bottom. But the answer, if markets aren't working, is not necessarily to go back to the post-war model of centralized state services. What we propose instead is a wider variety of models for owning and controlling services, both inside the state and outside the state. So doing this in ways that promote the public interest, not the interests of shareholders. So we want more co-ops, more mutuals, more non-profit enterprises, more co-production, and instead of competition, new collaborative partnerships between public authorities and non-profit organizations in civil society. When it comes to the benefits side of the social security coin, our proposals uh, focus on the culture of the system and its underlying values. How benefits are designed and administered have to recognize the value of unpaid as well as paid work and, and give priority to measures like child benefit, which prevent problems occurring instead of just picking up the pieces. And linking back to our proposals for releasing human resources, we suggest that job centers could be transformed by introducing the principles of co-production so that people who claim benefits and people who administer the system work together to identify and deliver the kind of support that people really need. Our own estimates suge uh, suggest that people spend something like 850,000 hours in job centers every month. So why not a time banking model which values these hours as part of a system of reciprocal exchange. Finally, we set out proposals for a sustainable future, showing how social policy and environmental policy have to work together and where the synergies are. So we show how social policies are needed to offset 
the regressive effects of some pro-environmental measures, like carbon pricing, for example, and how that can be done. And we show how public institutions like schools and hospitals and town halls and prisons can lead by example, cutting emissions, setting new standards in sustainable practice, and rolling it out to their contractors. We point to a range of eco-social policies where one kind of intervention can help to promote both social justice and environmental sustainability. Now, these can include things like retrofitting homes to make them more energy efficient and building new sustainable housing, like this estate in South London, which is designed to maximise energy efficiency, cut house household bills and encourage sharing between neighbours. Or active travel schemes, like walking school buses. Or um, more food produced and consumed locally or more com community-based initiatives to repair and exchange goods outside the formal economy. Things like tool sharing and food co-ops, as distinct from food banks, car clubs, repair centres, community cafes, and so on. Uh, common ownership of uh, utilities, particularly water and energy. Local labour used to retrofit homes. Local money being kept flowing around um, localities, around neighbourhoods, and the introduction of, of uh, complementary currencies to help that happen. All these things are part of that picture. And what we need to think about is this being the new normal, not exotic, marginal experiments as they are now, and on a large scale, elbowing out the grasping, high-carbon, disempowering alternatives of air conditioning and central heating in our homes and SUVs to take our children to schools and chain stores clogging up our um, high streets and so on. So that's the kind of vision that we need. And last but not least, as we learn more about planetary boundaries and how far we're already pushing beyond the limits of the natural environment, we need new mechanisms to future-proof policymaking so that we can anticipate the impact on future generations and avoid locking in measures that are unsustainable over time. We can learn from other countries like Norway and Finland who have found ways of doing this, not perfect, but at least a step in the right direction. And what's really shocking when you pause to think about it is that there's nothing like this in the UK. I mean, the last thing that was remotely like this was the Sustainable Development Commission, which was abolished by the coalition government in 2010. So that's been a quick gallop through our goals and our objectives and our practical proposals. There's a lot more detail in the report. Uh, here's how the bits of the jigsaw fit together. The proposals for practical change help to fulfill those distinctive objectives that I outlined, which in turn help to meet the goals of the settlement. And there's a dynamic relationship between them in which they all interact and sometimes reinforce each other. The purpose is to change systems and structures as well as to change ideas and attitudes, as well as to change services and other activities as well as to change the way we work and live together and value and care for each other. And none of this can, of course, be captured in a diagram like this. There are plenty of gaps. We don't say much about housing or education or tax or pension, for example. What we're trying to offer here is an analytical framework informed by evidence and inspired by ideals which integrates knowledge about society, environment, and the economy. And we hope that it will be useful for developing policy across the board, not just in the areas that we've dealt with in our report. So whatever we're trying to do, whatever we're trying to change, we must aim for social justice, environmental sustainability, and a more equal distribution of power. And we must learn how to flourish without growing the formal economy. We must aim to prevent harm before it happens not just cope with the consequences. We must nurture the core economy and foster solidarity. I want to finish with a word about ideology. Tony Blair famously declared that he wasn't interested in ideology. He was only interested in whatever works. David Cameron has insisted 
that his government's austerity drive is not based on some theory or ideology, they're just doing it because they have to. Politicians love to claim that they are above ideology, that what they do is based simply on hard facts and absolute necessity. They like to accuse their opponents of being ideological, always using the word as a term of abuse. So it's important to recognize that claiming that one set of ideas is above ideology is itself a function of ideology. As Terry Eagleton put it rather well, a ruling ideology does not so much combat alternative ideas as thrust them beyond the very bounds of the thinkable. The prevailing neoliberal agenda, which favors free markets, individualism, a small state, low taxes, and the primacy of economics, is no less ideological than our agenda, which favors social justice, environmental sustainability, and a more equal distribution of power. But for now, the neoliberal agenda is the dominant ideology, working hard, and it has been doing this for some time now, to render other ideas unthinkable, including the ideas I've put forward today. So that's what we have to change, and that's why we need a compelling alternative. Now, our work is, of course, just a beginning. There's plenty more to be done to arrive at a new settlement that has both the force and the endurance of the post-war settlement and the breadth of vision and the shift of purpose that are needed to deal with the huge challenges of the 21st century. Um, so that's really it. I was asked when I launched the report last week by somebody at the back and they said, that's all very well, but what's your Twitter line? <laughs> so, I haven't thought about this very much, but I did think we could say, it's not just the economy stupid, it's people and the planet. Um, that would be my line. But you see how impossible it is. This is not reducible to a Twitter line. It is complex because it is a big picture and it is about changing pretty much everything. So if you're interested in knowing more about what we said, you can download it from um, this link. Uh, anyway, you can find it on the New Economics Foundation website and download it. So I think that's all from me. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. First off, you said there's not enough. Uh, we could always share the, the manifesto at the front. Um, secondly, <laughs> uh, you said that um, obviously we're looking for a zero growth um, in the economy. With the world population increasing, would that not make people poorer? Like, I, you know, I don't know if we're looking to, or you're looking to stop popula world population going up. Um, okay, we'll take, we'll take two more questions, and I'm committed to having gender diversity in our questions, so... Uh. Hi, um, thank you so much for that, and I was wondering what role you see the arts playing in this changed economy? I think it's a fantastic vision that you've shown, but it strikes me that there are an awful lot of people in the world still who like being rich, and who like having power, and who are mostly in charge... And I was just wondering if you have any kind of ideas as to how we might persuade them that this is a great programme. <laughs> okay, shall I take those? Right. On the question of growth, I think you were asking what happens to, if we go to degrowth or no growth, um, what happens to people who, in, the poor, in poor countries? This is about the UK. The point about growth and the global economy is that we can only... If we're going to not fry the planet and, and, have, and not have any human civilization left to make settlements for, we have to keep uh, carbon emissions and other forms of environmental damage within very tight limits. So we have to constrain the growth in this country and in other uh, rich countries in order to allow some growth in developing in poor countries. So it's got to go that way, and that's the sort of... Um, yeah, that's the kind of deal, that, uh, which is why degrowth in the rich world is so very important and why a new social settlement has to plan without growth. Um, arts in the economy. 
Yes, well, lots, actually, because um, partly if you think about a world where we're not all just tied to the kind of work to live, live to work, work earn to buy, and that sort of consumer treadmill, that there are, there's plenty going on in the arts. It's got a very low carbon footprint that is very... Um, good at knitting people together in groups and across communities, and that is, is enriching of our everyday lives. So part of this vision is to say, well, you know, what really are our values? What do we want to, what, what is life for? And I think that there's much, there's a, there's a great opportunity in a way for arts organisations to um, show that other things are possible. I mean, there are cohorts of young children who think, that the best way to spend a weekend is going to the shopping mall. Uh, and, you know, they grow up to be grown-ups, and they still go to the shopping mall. And so it's a way of sort of carving out alternatives. So I think there's a lot to be said there. Now, um, yes, your point about uh, what can we do to start things changing when there's so many people um, defending their interests who have more power than we do. I would say look at what's happening in places like Greece and Spain, I think that this is possibly a moment when people realise that they've got to get out there and, and take power for themselves. I don't see it happening any time soon in, across the UK, but I think there are parts of the UK, I mean Scotland actually, good example, interesting things happening in Wales, and in cities where people can do things on a smaller scale, show what can be done, and get a kind of a, you know, a bandwagon effect going so that people can see that other things are possible. But I don't think we should ever underestimate um, the tendency or the, the huge and passionate desire of people who already have power to hang on to that power. I accept that this is a fantastic vision, and I believe that once we got there, it probably could work pretty well. But, but you also talked about neoliberal ideology, and I think it's more than ideology. It's now become more than ideology and more than a few powerful individuals. It's a whole system in which we are, we, we are now sort of stuck, really, where even national governments have very little control over what they can do. So although your vision is, is very attractive, I think getting there is um, extremely difficult. Uh, I, and I was actually going to give you the example of Greece, to say how difficult it is, not how easy it is to do it, because um, we can see that the Greeks had a, a fantastic, and the Greek people had this fantastic um, appetite for change and for social solidarity and so on, and it's going to be very, very hard for them to achieve even a small amount of, of, of what they hoped for. So I would like to ask you, if you were to get into government, uh, there are two big things that need to be sort of challenged, really. One is the neoliberal systems that we now live in. It's more than an ideology. And the other one is, is the sort of mindset and worldview that many of our fellow citizens have. So if you were to get into government, what would be the first thing you might try and do to address each of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. I mean, it seems to me... It this is more than a vision. This is a synthesis of lots of work New Economics Foundation has done over two and a half decades or more. And it's wonderful to see it uh, linked together in, in this way. Um, yes, yes, there are so sort of rich and powerful vested interests, very powerful, very dominant. But at the local level, I feel we've got many, many examples of greening the local economy, um, protecting nature, promoting repair and reuse, all the other sort of micro-level details that actually are part of this alternative system. Uh, despite the, the attempts to suppress it by the, the ruling elites. So how do we get people to recognise what they know and like and take part in in their community is actually part of an alternative rather than happening incidental or despite the system they're part of? Hi there, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm probably living proof that uh, reducing your working hours can actually get you more engaged in politics because uh, I became freelance at the end of 2013 and something quite similar happened to me. Uh, but my question is about essentially a lot of the efforts on these sort of programs are all about challenging power and challenging the people in control. But how about empowering people on the ground? As this gentleman said, local 
initiatives are quite effective. And uh, as the lady in front of him said, there really is this entire system and sort of all these structures in society that do, in, you know, uh, exclude all other kinds of ideas from discourse and actually from birth people are being raised in environments where these, in, these ideas aren't actually coming to them. So in a certain way, a lot of the, um, a lot of the environmental issues globally stem from demand in the West for consumer goods. And I even heard something the other day actually about a, um, a carbon offset scheme in South America that was actually forcing indigenous people off their land which was being used to farm intensively and self-sufficiently. So that seems a very self-defeating prospect. So essentially, what can we do uh, in terms of education, in terms of empowerment, to allow people to grow their own food, to skill themselves up, to reduce their, their demands, and also sort of obviate the need for, for consumption that seems to be completely endemic in the same way that these people have been talking about in front of me? Um, the woman who asked about uh, changing the system and um, how difficult the Greeks were finding it. Well, you're obviously a glass half empty person. I'm a glass half full person, otherwise I'd go mad in this job I do. Um, and I think it is difficult for them at the moment, but I mean, these things happen, you know, they, you have an ebb and a flow and you also have a certain movement in, in particular directions. I mean, in another talk, I, I have a slide, which I can't put up now, but it shows all the things that were once thought completely inconceivable um, that changed in a very short space of time, say about 50 years or so, or sometimes a lot less. And once they changed, it became inconceivable to change them back again. And those included the slave trade, uh, motorcycle helmets. Some of you here will remember when that was first mooted and it was regarded as a terrible onslaught on our individual liberties. Um, the smoking ban, only recently, absolutely thought to be inconceivable you could stop people smoking in public places. And votes for women, once thought unimaginable. And now, of course, all these things are the norm and acceptable. So we need to understand better what are the things that come together to make those changes happen. And um, uh, it, it can include things like uh, external circumstances that change, uh, a pile-up of evidence. Certainly that was true in terms of smoking. Leadership, uh, changing in, uh, in the political climate, and so on. So don't despair. The fact that the Greeks are finding it difficult now doesn't mean they're going to be finding it difficult in five years' time or even in two years' time. It might mean that they're doing something different, but things are changing. And so we need to understand that process and, and keep an eye on that half-full glass. Um, was it you who asked me what was the first thing I would do? Listen, you know, I am not a politician. I'm here saying this is the direction we need to move in. I mean, I would like to take profit-seeking companies out of all delivery of public services. Of course, you couldn't do that overnight because we would have no public services, but I'd like to say that that was a really, certainly take it out of the NHS as fast as we possibly can. But that's not going to quite achieve what um, you would like us to achieve. I think it's... Um, enabling local government to really support with serious resources the um, community-based activities. So I think that's important. Um, now, some, yes, you were right, the second question to say, this is uh, bringing a lot of the work that NEF has done over the last oh, 25 years, but particularly the last five, I suppose, into one place. Lots of things that we're not including that are really important, like work we're doing on reform of the finance system and, you know, how we need uh, uh, local banking and so on. So there's lots more that NEF has done that isn't, hasn't been mentioned today and isn't even in the report. Not that it's not important, it's just you have to stop somewhere. And you talked about local examples and... Um, how people are increasingly uh, prefiguring what is possible at a local level. And this whole move towards collaborative consumption and kind of what you might call post-materialist living, with some people doing it, other people thinking they're completely mad, but starting to do things in different ways. This is the beginning. 
And these are the examples that we need in order to find ways of building it up and, and, and spreading it across. Not that you can just pick out one example and say, oh, look, here's a ma machine tool sharing thing. Let's scale it up and have it in every town and village across the country. That never works. But um, showing that other things are possible and working from the bottom up is very important. The reason I kept talking, I don't know if you noticed, but kept referring to national government is because this is the thing that at the New Economics Foundation, we're quite conflicted between whether we really just all about localism, um, because we've got a very strong sort of um, intellectual and political allegiance to um, the Liberal Democrats and that sort of and the Green Party. So is it all about localism? But the minute we start thinking about, about the big picture, we always come back to saying we need government to change as well. And one of the main reasons why we need government at a national level to, to be corralled into the cause of making all this happen, if you like, is that if we just leave it to localism, it will be very uneven and very unequal. And the communities that have the most resources will probably do best. Not always, but most often. So we need to find ways of using the machinery of government to make those opportunities for bottom-up local activities equal. I did make that point, but I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to make it more strongly. Oh, yes, the, the, the thing about how the, our activities are um, creating uh, really serious problems in the developing world. And yes, I mean, when we think about cutting carbon emissions, we have to think about cutting the emissions that we export, which is something like 70%. There are probably other people in this room who know this better than I do. 70% of the emissions that we actually cause we've exported because we're buying things that are made overseas. So we have to think globally. And I'm sorry, I can't present this to you as a, as a whole settlement for the whole of the world, but we'd be here for about three weeks. And uh, you know, I'd have had to have had another 50 years to produce it. But it, uh, we do understand the importance of um, situating this discourse or this set of arguments, if you like, in an understanding of how we affect the rest of the world and what's going on in the rest of the world. You talked about a system that's actually worked in, say, for example, uh, countries like Norway and Finland. I mean, we've almost forgotten to take into account that Norway is stunningly rich with, because of having a vast resource of oil and gas that's sitting there. I mean, from one of the things that seems rather counterintuitive is that two examples that might, you know, some people would say, sort of mirror the work of the New Economics Foundation have almost, one of them has actually already been shown to, have, I mean, has more or less collapsed, which is communism. And the other one that is uh, basically, say for example, the socialist ideology, say for example, in countries like France, which has, has had very strict 35 hour week uh, retirement limits for age, um, high pay structures, unions. I mean, they're now finding that they're actually having uh, more of an outflow rather than an inflow and actually are now almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, being, active, being actively promoting uh, uh, the, the way we do things here in the UK. Um, so how would you sort of, uh, you know, put those two examples in light of what you've said? And the second question is about, you haven't taken into account, uh, well, you've talked about population control, but what about immigration? Because there's this huge uh, negativity always around the subject of immigration where people cannot share in something that's actually uh, good for them and, well, good on the longer run maybe in our society. So how would a, an ideal society benefit when more people want to come in? here? Um, thanks for a fantastically inspiring talk. Um, I think what we've got to hold in our heads all the time is, is, is a, that inspiration to say, well, look around at the collective services that we already have and have achieved, like libraries, like children's centres, um, uh, like all the things are, uh, to do that have started around the environment, and say, it's possible, isn't it fantastic that we have places we can go and borrow books and tapes and so on for free, I mean, pay out of taxation, but they, they work. And so why can't so many other things work 
And it is possible, and it's possible for, for Greek people, to, for the Greeks to, 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 to sort out their economy, and we should take inspiration from that. But it, it's kind of remembering that we can have the services that we deserve. I'm going to play devil's advocate to some degree. I think, in fact, we need to move beyond ideology, not in the sense of the ideology you spelt out about Blair and Cameron, but uh, John Lindbeck's book of that name, Beyond Ideology, is perhaps as good a starting point as any. Secondly, I'm always suspicious when things like capitalism are sort of blamed for the ills of the world. And I'll go back to, if you like, the arch-prophet of capitalism, Adam Smith. And he made the point that in order for capitalism to work, it had to be moral and ethical. Well, self-evidently, it isn't either moral or ethical. But again, what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with a problem that emanates from systems? Or are we dealing with the problems that emanate from human nature? So at that level, it doesn't matter whether you call a system, a socialist system, a communist system, a liberal system, a capitalist system. What always throws the spanner in the work are the, if you like, the flaws in human nature. We're always faced with whatever greed, corruption, whatever you care to call it. <clears throat> so I think the notion that simply changing systems is going to sort out the planet is uh, yeah, uh, the road to nowhere. Third and last point, um, for all its ills, um, in the post Deng Xiaoping uh, era in China, they have, if you like, through capitalism, lifted more people out of poverty, yes, with great harshness, at great cost and all the rest of it, but uh, there would have been a great cost in, in not doing that. So I'm always a little bit suspicious of over-ideological, over-idealistic systems because at the end of the day, whatever it is, it's got to work. And I think the problems, although they may appear systemic, in fact, uh, come from deep flaws within human nature. Thank you. Well, what about Norway's oil wealth? Um, I wasn't um, endorsing the oil wealth by saying that they have written into their constitution something that says they have to anticipate the future effects of their, of their policies. That is simply a model that we could learn from. So I don't want to get into a debate about what Norway is up to, just to say that that is simply, we did some work looking at what other countries were doing, that's one model. And similarly with Finland. Now you talked about France and the 35 hour week. Actually, you know, there's an awful lot of um, misunderstanding about what happened in France. It's certainly true that they introduced a 35 hour week by legislation, there were two laws, known as the Aubrey Laws. And um, if you look at our proposals, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to go through them today, we always say this needs to be done gradually over a decade or so, and it needs to start on a voluntary basis with incentives rather than passing a law. But when, it was, uh, when the French law was eventually lost virtually all its power, it was never thoroughly repealed, um, it, was, it was always popular particularly with parents with young children, right from the start. It remained quite popular with a lot of employees and a lot of workplaces kept the 35-hour week even after they didn't have a law telling them to do it. So we need to... Um, and there's a, there's a chapter in this book, actually, about the French experiment, which is worth looking at. So that's France and Norway. And um, you asked about immigration. Well, everything that I've tried to say about social justice and inequality will have to, be, uh, have to apply to a society that is taking more and more immigrants because we have to take more and more people. They are good for our society, they're good for the economy, but they're also uh, an inevitable consequence of what's happening in the wider world, some of it, much of it, which we have helped to bring about. So um, I don't think we can solve any of the problems that I've identified about inequalities and environmental unsustainability and unequal distributions of power by keeping uh, immigration out. I, I know that wasn't what you were suggesting, but I just wanted to say that, although I would not claim to be any kind of an expert on that particular subject. Now, um, here we have someone who's clearly a glass half full person <laughs> saying, um, we have libraries and children's centres and they work, and so that shows what can be done. And indeed, if we do pool our resources and if we do share, we can have more of that. 
And the, the enemy is not the fact that this is unaffordable. Once you start looking at where the money is going, and if you see how the money is being siphoned off into um, the profits of, of private companies and going into shareholders' pockets and the pay of the rich and so on, you realise we could have, and of course tax avoidance and so on, you could have these, um, these really excellent services uh, in, a, in an enduring and widespread way. Yes, that's uh, important. Now, um, ideology. I think claiming that the whole thing is a problem with human nature is ex itself an ideology. That is an ideology. So, um, yes, you're very welcome to your ideology. I don't share it. I think um, there are things that we can identify that uh, people have certain traits and, you know, but I'm very much in, um, perhaps, uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in revolt against the current fashion for uh, neuroscience and behavioural science. It's a way of solving our problems, which says that if anybody could get into the, you know, the right lobe of the brain and work out, you know, how to sort of fix something, the people will be more obedient or, you know, they'll work harder or whatever, it, or they'll stay and love their families more than they do now. This, I think, is... Um, I, I think it's a... It's, it's, it's a... It's just like giving us, you know, a sugared pill. Oh, yes, it's all in the brain. We don't have to worry about uh, the distribution of material resources. We don't have to worry about what we're doing with the environment. It all comes down to, um, to the flaws in human nature. Of course, we are all flawed, but we can overcome that. And indeed, we often have. And so we're just going to do it again and not worry about that. And you said, oh yes, interesting point. You said China had managed to uh, get all these people out of poverty. True. Interestingly, they didn't do it with a very flourishing democratic system. But they have done quite a bit of that. And I think we all need to watch and see what happens next. But you then talked about pragmatism. You see, saying that you're just being pragmatic is like Tony Blair saying he's only going to do what the evidence tells him. Because that's pragmatic, and it's, you know, he's only going to do what common sense tells him. So that's why I'm really keen to reclaim the idea that we can, we can act out of ideas and ideals, not just out of evidence and pragmatism. So thank you for raising those three points at the end. Um, you misinterpreted them. Well, I'm very sorry if I did. So I think that's all we have time for now. So shall we... Thank you. Uh,